What I like about the Mediat's puzzles is the consistent enjoyability. I hardly remember one time when Dumiat asked me to test a puzzle and I didn't like it. When it comes to Doom Diat puzzles, they always make me think nobody asked for these genres to be combined and yet somehow they always feel cohesive and very enjoyable to solve. I appreciate uh, Doom Diat's puzzles not for their visual appeal. In fact, when I see one, um, I'm not immediately t enticed to try it by anything other than um, that I know the author and I know that he's clearly found something, some logical nook and cranny or some rule set idea that is going to be just delightful. So if you do see a puzzle by Dumi Adyat, um, don't think too hard about what it looks like. Um, just give it a solve and I know you won't be disappointed. Dumediad is the master of multiple constraints. Which constraints? Multiple constraints. Whether it's the synthesis of Killer, Renban, and Antinite, or the intergrowth of a cycle look and say, entropic and modular lines. Dumediad is the master of multiple constraints. Dumediad often combines rule sets that I've never seen before together to amazingly fun puzzles. Always exciting, always, always fun, always great. Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to the Doom Diat special, Setter Spotlight. Hello. How are you doing today, Doom Diat? Doing pretty great. How about you? Pretty great, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm that excited. Was, that was a bizarre <laughs> circumstance with the, the intro video. The first just chameleons video played out of my speakers, and the rest of them played in my headphones. And I was like, what is happening? Is this... Can everyone hear it okay? I, it's weird. Very, yeah. very loudly out of my speakers also. So yeah, that was that was jarring. <laughs> We're all awake for the interview, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I should, before we get going, just advertise that uh, this lovely graphic we have here. So a bunch of people have been voted to be interviewed, including this lovely man up here. Uh, and then we have Analytic Linja, Chameleon, Pietato, uh, Chris O'Net, Bill Murphy, and Ambrose still in the running. And if you follow the instructions, which I can't even remember where the instructions are, you can get votes and vote for candidates such as these. And we can vote for multiple people or multiple times in the same person now. So small ad for that. This is how we get people like, like Doom Diet in here. Okay, coming back to these lovely Patreon supporter people around us who have uh, helped make Doom Diet's interview possible and rolling into that interview itself. <laughs> uh, Doom Diet, uh, what, do what do you do for work? I'm a pharmacist. So, and oh, I'm fun. probably not the type of pharmacist you think. So I used to work in a hospital, but I work for a drug information company. So I do more with, um, like you get all these government like information mm -hmm. about what the drugs do, but I try to get all that plus all the clinical research that's been done, synthesize all that. And then, so people who prescribe drugs, pharmacists, you know, nurses, everyone can uh, have more updated information on it rather than just what the government gives you. Interesting. That's a, that's a cool job that I didn't know even existed. So good to know. Yeah, most people, it's like, there's only like <laughs> two, three companies in the U.S. that even do it. So yeah, right, okay. a little bit of a niche niche area of it. Uh, so whereabouts in the U.S. do you live? Uh, Northeast Ohio, so Cleveland area. Cool, yeah. I feel like there's other puzzle people around the area, but I can't remember who. Um, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of puzzling? Yeah, so I um, I play chess quite a bit, um, a little bit of bass guitar when I have free time, which isn't very often. I have kids that are six and eight, so I don't have a ton of that, but uh, <laughs> most of what I do have is spent on making and setting puzzles and solving them. But uh, I also do a lot of stuff outdoors, like hiking, biking, that sort of thing. No longer running, but uh, you know, try to get outside. 
yeah, r- running kind of sucks as someone who it does. It does. recently <laughs> gave up running. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Everyone says it's great, and then you do it for a while, yeah. and it feels great. And then after a while, your body's like, stop it, especially yeah. when you are get a, a little closer to my age. Yeah. And depending on, on the weather, it's, I mean, if you're running outside, it, that is uh, the weather sometimes just really yeah. affects how, how well you can run outside. Um, yeah, Northeast Ohio is either winter or it's like 90 degrees. There's, there's yeah. not a lot of in between. <laughs> no good time to run. <laughs> exactly. Uh, how do you balance puzzling with the other things in your life, including your children, which, yeah, that would yeah. be a hard balance for sure. It is difficult. Yeah. Um, it's a lot easier now that, yeah, the kids are getting a little older and actually interested in puzzles themselves. Uh, my son is like trying to solve like phenomenal style puzzles. So like, I, I'll give him like, and my daughter does like four by four and some six by six Sudoku's. Um, uh-huh. so you know, we do that a little bit together, but yeah. Um, sometimes I don't do such a great job balancing, like it, it creeps into the work life or it creeps into other things that it shouldn't be, but you know, something that you're passionate about that, that tends to happen. You just have to occasionally take breaks and figure out like, you know, what's priority at the moment can't mm-hmm. always be puzzles, even though you usually want it to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's great. I, I love seeing whenever people say that they, they've solved puzzles with their children or set puzzles with their children. It's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be fun to set it at some point with them. I'm still trying to get my daughter to stop guessing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's probably a four. Yeah. Still trying to get uh, my, my fiance to stop guessing too. So. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about Sudoku, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, do you have any pets other than your children? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have any pets. Uh, we were a dog family, but we had, um, right. I haven't had any pets for about a year and a half now. Oh, okay. Uh, do, do, do you have an unusual skill or talent? I don't know. I don't know about anything like unusual like that. Um, can't think of anything off the top of my head. Okay, <laughs> no worries. About the children. Yeah. Uh, speaking of things that you probably can't think of off the top of your head, um, what was the last thing you felt that was unpleasant? The last thing I felt was unpleasant, like in general? Like uh, that you that you felt with your hands. That was unpleasant oh, to touch. Um, hmm. Well, I have kids that are six and eight, so that comes up often. <laughs> they were making, uh, I don't know, you know those, like, I don't know if you've seen these things. They're called beetos, but they're, like, these tiny little um, balls that when you put them in water, they end up growing. Oh, yeah, I saw, I saw one of those just the other day yeah. for some reason. Yeah. So my kids had the container of this that they were using, like for uh, my my son likes like stimulating stuff like that. So he'll we had it so it was a bunch of colors. So when you turned it upside down, like the colors would shift. Right. And he we lost it, and then he found it about three years later, and then opened it, and we had to clean that up, and it was pretty disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> it was like this weird sludge that was in our basement. So, oh. yeah. Uh. Okay, another kind of interesting question. I mean, I hope all the questions are interesting, actually. But uh, <laughs> if you were to be interviewed on a different topic, what would you choose? Hmm. Probably. Huh. I do a lot of work with um, diversity through my employer, and it's something that's not just specific to. Um, where I work. So I usually like talking about those types of things. So that's probably the topic I would pick. It is, it is a very interesting topic. Probably could. Yeah. We write a lot of most of the stuff that I do with work is all written words. So you're kind of like always unsure who your audience is. Cause there's like, right. you know, millions of people looking at it. So, um, we have done a lot of work with trying to make it. So, you know, we're, we're using the rock right language. Mm. So that's something that's what I'm passionate about. 
Well, that's that's always good to hear that people are passionate yeah. about that. Um, all right, maybe maybe we'll do one more one more touched question. What's something you've never touched but you think might be quite quite pleasant to touch? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Something that I haven't touched that would be pleasant to touch. Um, Could be like an animal or like volcano. Yeah, it's going to be weird. Yeah. You have an idea? Yeah. So it's very, ner well, I mean, we're all nerdy, right? But from yeah. a pharmacy perspective, uh, <laughs> there was this old, uh, up in Niagara Falls area, there was an old uh, apothecary that had these like first edition um, textbooks from mm -hmm. like physician's desk references, these old, like from the 1800s, like old medicine type things. And my wife and I went up there and we missed an auction by a day where I would have oh. had a chance to buy one. So that would have been cool to, to see, I guess, touch. Yeah. That's an interesting, yeah. All right. It's just to spark a weird memory. So that's, that's a good, that's a good story. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's, let's move Other people are picking like dogs. That would be nice too. Yeah. Okay. That would be nice too. Yeah. Quite pleasant. I mean, I think I'm going to assume most people have touched a dog at some point. <laughs> <laughs> if not, that, please go out and touch a dog. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm sure the owner won't mind. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, let's get into some puzzle questions. Oh, and thank you to all those patrons that were on the screen. I, I didn't mean to destroy that without thanking them all. All right, moving on. <laughs> okay, so the first question that I usually ask is, what is the first puzzle that you ever set? Uh, the first puzzle I ever set was a very sort of creatively named classic number one. <laughs> uh, it's on LMD. It's not the first one on my LMD page, but it's the first puzzle I set. Um, pretty much, I'd say like maybe about six months after I started watching like Cracking the Cryptic is how I actually got into the hobby of variant Sudoku. Uh, Clover had a video about setting puzzles, and mm -hmm. so that inspired me to make try to make a classic Sudoku. Hmm. Um, I thought it was garbage. So it <laughs> took me like another like 12 months to set my next puzzle. Uh, but, you know, I, I did end up uploading that eventually and they got decent ratings. So can't be too mad about it. I'm still waiting to set classic number two, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> the second ever classic. A lot Sudoku. Harder. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It is. It is. In, it's a different thing, for sure, to set classic Sudoku than variant Sudoku. Like, it just is a different thing. Yeah, it's. I don't know what it is about it, but um, I, I try. I, I have a few like classic Sudoku ideas and things that I've tried, but it takes me at least five to six times the the time and effort to make one of those than it does to make like any variant Sudoku. I don't know. Don't know what it is or what it is with my brain, but. I feel like I'm decent at solving them, just definitely yeah. not setting them. <laughs> I, I I don't know what it is, but every time I try to set a classic, when I finish setting it, I'm like, oh, that's it? Okay, it's done. I don't know, that didn't... Yeah. Doesn't seem good enough for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's my experience, too. It's always yeah. anticlimactic. It's like, oh, that's... I guess the digits are done now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we draw but then, something? But like solving or... really good classic Sudoku puzzles. Yeah, it's, it's like fun. I don't get the same feeling. Like you find really good ones, and you're like, "Oh, this is like one of my favorite puzzles," or whatever. And then yeah. you try setting something, even if it's the same, it never feels quite quite that yeah. way. For sure, there's a different feel. For sure. Um, what was the first variant Sudoku you ever set? That's a, that's a different question. <laughs> that's yeah, that's my uh, the first puzzle I have on LMD. Uh, the, the rotational symmetry uh, intentionally misspelled. Uh, <laughs> that was, a, there's a little bit of a funny story behind that puzzle. It, it, it's the, um, the classic, you know, people talk, talked about, I know on this channel and elsewhere, uh, setting for Simon from CTC. Mm. Uh, so it's kind of like, once I watched enough of it and I felt comfortable solving a lot of them, I was like, oh, I could probably set one. And uh, minor spoilers or maybe major spoilers for people who haven't solved it, but that was the height of set 
on, on cracking the cryptic when like every other feature was a set puzzle and they were kind of getting increasingly bizarre and you know you start with a fist of fell ring and then you move on to like some of the imbalance sets that they did and so like i bet i can come up with something like that so i created that puzzle um with that mindset to say like oh i bet you know i can make a really cool set and, and i think it ended up turning out pretty well but um it took about a year and a half to get like officially rated on LMD <laughs> just because it's such an obscure, like it's, it's not a well telegraphed set. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. But the funny, the other funny thing, like everyone always asks me, like, why did you misspell or did you notice you misspelled <laughs> the title? And it's because of the Kropke dots. Um, I wanted it to be rotationally symmetric, but I couldn't get a solution with my grid by putting anything to disambiguate the deadly patterns at the end. So I just, I kind of got frustrated and I just like renamed the puzzle and just misspelled some of the words to, to kind of show that it's not symmetric. <laughs> I, I love the idea that people are just like, uh, you, do, did you know you spelled it wrong? It's yeah. like the second last puzzle I published was uh, a pun on mash, mash up. And there were more than a couple people who s said, did, did did you spell uh, mashy wrong? I'm like, no, it's, yeah. it's a pun. Uh, I had to add it to the, the thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No one said it in LMD, but like a few people in Discord like were doing live solves and, and mentioned that the title wasn't spelled right. <laughs> well, I just yeah, tried to play it off like, oh, it's not. I should go back and fix that. It's Why didn't nobody notice that for 18 months <laughs> or two years? <laughs> well, uh... I guess, how long did it take you to set that from beginning to end? Uh, I don't really remember. I don't remember it taking a ton of time. Mm -hmm. uh, the break-in idea was, ended up being, I remember it being pretty forcing. Um, it puts like, I think once you get the break-in, you get like almost half the digits in the grid. Just okay, like kind yeah. of iterates and, and, you, and you end up getting like a lot of the grid solved. It was more just like trying to figure out it was a, be my first puzzle. So like trying to figure out how to end the puzzle well and not mm -hmm. just like put random stuff in the grid until it's unique. And I, I guess probably a little bit to my advantage as a new solver is there really was, or I wasn't aware of like solving support at that point. So it was all sort of trial and error and actually trying to figure out like, okay, what, what can I see at that point? You know, being more of an intermediate setter like that I can put in here to make this unique. Yeah. And so that's where those dots came in at the end. I probably could have done something differently in the mid solve and not needed the dots, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. It, it becomes a problem later as a advanced setter when you don't even have to use the, the, um, computer tools to just see where the unique solutions lie. You're like, Oh, if I just put this random thing here, then I know it's going to solve, but yeah stopping yourself from doing that and making it actually interesting is is the tricky part <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you also get the impending sense of doom at the end of the puzzle where you're like this is going to be a a deadly pattern isn't it yeah. and then like at the end he's like yep it's a deadly pattern yeah. i gotta go back <laughs> <laughs> uh so obviously you watched cracking the cryptic before you started setting hot how, how long did it take before you you decided hey i, I should try this <laughs> Yeah, it was probably about maybe nine months or so. I started watching it actually just before the pandemic started. Mm. It, it was actually some of the um, the crossword puzzles that they were doing at the time were coming up on my uh, recommended videos on YouTube. And then at the time, like, I was always kind of loosely interested in, in classic Sudoku anyway, like solving it. Um, and then I noticed that they had a couple Sudoku videos. And so I started watching those and then you know, I was like, oh, I'll get back into solving Sudokus and then slowly ended up uh, deciding to try to set it. Um, I, th I think, I don't remember exactly when those How I Set Sudoku videos started on their channel, um, but it was around that time when I when I started. I, I always had this thought that, like, solving puzzles, you know, was kind of a nice, like, downtime activity, you know, but setting puzzles was some sort of, like, high academic, like, 
you know, people sitting in like leather armchairs, like with, you know, trying to like come up with these ideas to set puzzles. And it was like some really like lofty, you know, goal to be able to actually set something like that. But I was kind of surprised. That, and I think Mixo mentioned this during his interview. It's just like, it's a lot, it's much more similar to just setting a puzzle than like any other hobby would be like, I'm playing bass guitar. Like I can play a song, but I can't like write a song. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's, so it, it's a lot, I think closer in this For hobby sure. than it is in a lot of others. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot, it's fun by itself, I think in, in a different way than solving is, but it, it's still yeah. just as fun. Um, what was I going to say? I had a thought. Oh yeah, the um, the leather armchairs and stuff. I think some of the setters' names that were featured a lot early, early on, like in the pandemic, seem to like lean more towards that. Also, like that that vision, like uh, Ard van Vettering, and like oh, like these fancy names of fancy yeah. people. <laughs> yeah, they sound like old, like classic, like literature yeah, authors, and, and that where it's just you know. Not having been, not having known these people, because I wasn't active in the CTC Discord for quite a while, even when I started setting. Mm -hmm. So, like, I didn't know, like, really any of these people, like, who had been setting at that time, even people who don't kind of like exude that persona. Uh, I still kind of had that just that weird image in my head of like, this is what it takes to make a uh, a good logic puzzle. Right. Yeah, I'm sure there is a fair number of fancy armchair people as well. So. It might be. Yeah, there might, there might be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's definitely more accessible, I yes, think. Yes, for sure, uh, yeah. To, to, to a wider range of people. For sure. Uh, so how long after setting did it take to get your your first CTC feature, uh, which I have uh, ready here, as opposed to last time? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember exactly when embark got featured but that was my first puzzle that got featured and it was under dubious circumstances i guess it was okay. that um uh the experiment that ctc did where they had people vote on which puzzle they wanted people to see next and they pitted my puzzle against uh knt i think it was his pathfinder uh, chaos construction puzzle mm. and of course mine being a fog puzzle like you know that was and and is the one of the most popular uh, mechanics uh, in Sudoku. So naturally, you know, people voted for that. I'm thankful for that. But it always felt like the second I saw that, I immediately like I messaged KNT. I'm like, this is awful. Like I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like why? And then also like kind of the person whose video got or puzzle got featured the day before. Like nobody commented on this person's puzzle. They were all commenting on you know, who, what they wanted to see the next day. So it kind of felt bad in a few ways. Mm. Uh, but, you know, it it's water under the bridge at this point. But, yeah, I think to answer that question, I'm trying to see when it actually got featured. I think it was January, yeah, January 2023. Yeah, 2023, yeah. Yeah, so it was about um, two years after I, I, I published my first puzzle on LMD. So it took quite a while. Yeah. Um, not for lack of trying. <laughs> I, I think I, I think I got, I sent in maybe eight or nine puzzles into them. Um, that didn't end up getting featured for whatever reason it was. And then, um, this puzzle actually, I think got recommended by a bunch of people. And so this wasn't one that I had set in. So it, it, it seems to be kind of true what, what people say about, you know, they tend to favor outside recommendations yeah. more than self recommendations, but. For yeah. sure they do, I think, at least. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. You never hear anything one way or the other, so you no. just kind of hope. I was, like, at the point where I'm, like, maybe, like, something with my emails, like, are getting blocked or something, or, you know. But Honestly, I, I wouldn't put it past them to just block <laughs> some people who email, because, like, yeah, honestly. They I, might, I, bet yeah, they get, I bet they get way too many emails from certain people. <laughs> I can't imagine just like the number of emails they must get in yeah. general. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think with my university email, I think I have probably a good, a good, um, 
uh, what is the word like contender for number of emails in a single day uh, or <laughs> per day because I've been through so many departments that I just I still get all their emails I'm on all the mailing lists and they just keep sending them you can't get off the mailing <laughs> list so just get like a hundred emails a day for no reason <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. so stupid anyways yeah well yeah it was like you know I'll, I'll, I'll kind of speak candidly about that whole like mindset of like it going two years before because like some you see some people like you know when you're setting it seems like they start setting puzzles and they get featured immediately right and you know those types of things are thinking in your head a little bit or in my head anyway about like, you know these people mm -hmm. are getting, like must be better solver or setters than i am or whatever um but it was funny because around the same time i started actually really getting serious about setting and actually setting like frequently it's probably about May 2021, maybe a little bit after that, um, I started getting uh, involved watching like Zetamass streams and kind of getting involved there. So, and then getting, you know, they would show puzzles of mine on there too. So it wasn't necessarily like the first time any one of my puzzles actually like had right. some kind of like public site to it. So I, I try to, um, people ask me this a lot with like ctc is like you can tell they're kind of setting because they want a ctc feature i'm like you know yeah. that's not that shouldn't be the goal necessarily you know there's a lot of content creators out there who you know showcasing people's puzzles and maybe to more appropriate audiences mm -hmm. than to ctc in some cases like ctc i think tends to favor more like the wild wacky out there difficult puzzles more so but mm -hmm. there's a lot of other like content creators out there including you who are solving puzzles online that, you know, I think that should be an accolade as well, not just CTC. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's probably more helpful as a setter anyway. You're, you're getting some interaction about somebody setting, like solving your puzzle and what they're looking at. Um, as opposed to CTC, you're just kind of watching a recorded video. Yeah, I've, I've, I've never understood why they don't stream more puzzle content, but I guess it's just like the timing and stuff. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so some things we'll never know <laughs> that's right but uh yeah but it definitely is not all about ctc and i i definitely agree that there's there's a lot of benefits to the other content creators that have propped up in the scene uh including like Zetamath and ranks and uh i think there's, there's quite a few more people who are doing that now, which is great. The codec even streams yeah, like, sometimes, so. Yeah, the Vario, Brunster, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people out there, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a market that's been saturated <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there, there's, there's, um, there's an audience for it, so. Dedicated audience, for sure. so. All right, so let's roll down to someone's question. Uh, Isaiah asks, where does the name Dundiet come from? Yeah, some people know this lore, uh, but it's, um, so maybe tw it, almost 20 years ago now, uh, I was in college and that was sort of the height, if anyone remembers for online poker, like back in 2003, there was like that World Series of Poker and the was his name Chris Moneymaker? I think like was this a random nobody who ends up winning the whole thing, and then everybody started playing online poker because they wanted to be the next Chris Moneymaker. <laughs> so uh, I was playing online, and I was in some kind of I forget what even what style of poker I was playing, but I ended up bluffing and winning a pot because I ended up hitting cards I needed later in the hand, and the person called me a dumb idiot, spelled like my name is spelled. <laughs> and so, and he kept saying it over and over again, like while we were playing and he finally like left the, the table. And that was back when you could like, you know, swap tables and play multiple tables. I think he probably can still do that. Uh, so, but the guy kept losing money to me during like all these hands. And so I figured, well, this guy's like mad now and he's just gonna keep trying to bet me out of pots and I'm gonna win a bunch more money from him. So I changed my username to D uh, dumb idiot <laughs> spelled that way and then followed him around a bunch of poker tables and kept he kept like getting more and more angry and losing more and more money to me uh so it ended up i ended up sticking with it and 
I uh, eventually learned that like once there was more like Twitch streaming, um, mm -hmm. I was taking chess lessons and people were very uncomfortable, like calling someone a stranger on the internet, dumb idiot to their face. Right. So I changed the <laughs> pronunciation to doomed yet. I was like, you can pronounce it that way. Um, and so one of my, my chess coach at the time, uh, if I was playing well that day, he would call me doomed yet. And if I wasn't, he would call me dumb idiot. Like, so <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's amazing. I still, I still go with that. That's that's great. I answer to both. If anyone's wondering, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's 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 a great story. Yeah. Uh, Helioplox, is that is that how you say that name? He Helioplox. I always say Polix? Heliopolis in my head, but I'm, I'm I'm actually not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. There are some names which I just have taken for granted and have never actually said out loud. Um, Relatable. Uh, he asks a very poignant question: uh, Why, why you set puzzles? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, mean, I can't I, believe I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I set puzzle because. I mean, I, I've always, like I mentioned, I've always enjoyed solving puzzles. And um, once I started setting them, I started getting like a lot deeper appreciation for just like kind of them and, and, and trying to get a better understanding for what kind of logic goes into some deductions, what's available. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that have been explored, a lot of things that haven't been explored. And so um, I, I've been in academia most of my career. So like, I always have this learner mindset so part of the reason I like setting puzzles is because I like solving them. And I always feel like the best way to learn something is just to play around with constraints and like figure things out that way. That's the, the way I've learned best. And so, um, but I also set puzzles now, now that I've, I've kind of gotten more comfortable with it and I, I feel a little bit more proficient at it. You know, it's fun to share puzzles with people. Um, I like making puzzle gifts for people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of a nice way, especially in our hobby where, you know, you can, uh, you can connect with people and, you know, meet people, uh, um, through this type of thing on discord. I tend to have a hard time, like on social media, like reaching out to people and like forming connections that way. So that's been like a really fun way for an easy way for me to be able to sort of dive into the community and, uh, kind of be more active that way. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's a great part of this community for sure. Sorry, but okay, everything is back to normal. There was a bit of weirdness with OBS while you yeah. were talking, but I, I listened, and uh, I'm sure everyone else <laughs> listened. <laughs> uh, I'm curious if did Doomdia cut out at all, guys, during that that little bit? Because I could hear his audio the whole time, but I'm not sure. If you guys missed something. Oh, I see. Yeah. Someone said I left the screen. Yeah. But I'm back. I feel like you could hear him the whole time because I could hear him the whole time. I think my Wi-Fi is doing a little bit of a of a not great. Video did, but not video. Uh, audio. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on, but hopefully it chills out. Speaking of the but, speaking of the birthday puzzles. Uh, micro study asked, what's your secret to turning out birthday or other gift puzzles? And are they all that are all somehow incredibly personalized and have a, a lot of thought put into them, which is a great question. I, I have the same question because I found that difficult. <laughs> yeah, I think it was just, um, uh, Definitely, like, obviously, I reach out to people and ask what they like. And then invariably, people will say, oh, I like all kinds of things. Yeah. Like, well, that doesn't help me at all. So I started asking, like, what don't you like? And that also mm -hmm. wasn't helpful because most people say nothing. I'm good with everything. So <laughs> I um, I ended up starting, well, there's a handful of people, like, on Discord that I know, like, more like more well than others just from interacting with them more often. So and then watching them solve puzzles. So I kind of get the sense of what what types of puzzles they like, what constraints, those types of things. Um, but also try to do like a little bit of recon if they're also setting puzzles, um, trying to solve some of their puzzles or, or look and see what types of puzzles they like solving on LMD. But I think the other part of what helps me, that's kind of like the basic stuff that I think most people do 
Um, but the part that helps me the most is probably my setting style is a lot more experimental on the experimental side. So I'm the type where if I go to start setting a puzzle, I sort of rarely have a, a really concrete idea in mind for what I want to do. I sort of just start throwing constraints in the, in the grid and see what happens. Mm, okay. And what I've, what I've tried doing is taking like some setters have either invented constraints or played around with different constraints that they, um, you know, maybe do little tweaks on it. And so I'll try to set a puzzle using that same constraint and see what I can come up with and then share it with them. And a lot of times, you know, people really like that, um, you know, what, seeing someone else set something that they've created or, you know, took the time to actually learn the constraint and, and share something about it. So, and that tends to start conversations like, you know, like I said, on, on Discord, even if they're, you know, just connections you make, building your puzzle friend circle and all that. Yeah, for so sure. I, and then plus, I, I enjoy that type of thing anyway. Like, that's one of the things that I enjoy most about the hobby, too. So, you know, that, that, that kind of helps, I think, with maybe the quality that comes out of them. I mean, I guess, I guess it feels quite obvious now that you say it. Like, just think about what you do for Secret Santa and apply that mm -hmm. to every birthday. And yeah. Secret Santa is really fun to set for, so. Uh, it is, yeah. yeah. So then yeah, it makes sense. It's funny too, because I think, I think I've had six CTC features and I, I can't remember either three or four of them were puzzles that I had set for people's birthdays, oh. <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> that is funny. Uh, Powerfly asked, Did, have you ever had a birthday puzzle be non-unique? I guess we could probably apply that question to general. Like, have you ever published something that was accidentally non-unique? Yeah, so fortunately, the answer to both those questions is no, because probably that's my biggest fear as a setter, is especially as a birthday gift. Like, here's a puzzle, and then they send it back, like, yeah, this has two solutions. <laughs> <laughs> it should be like the, the, the worst feeling in the world. Uh, I tend to get um, some of the puzzles I set are like basic constraints, so I can test it with a solver just to make sure that it's unique before even before I send it out to testers. Right. But um, I usually like test solve my puzzles four, five, six times before I send it out for public testing, or in this case, private testing. Like I'm sending like a birth birthday gift out, I'll, I'll message it to people. So I usually try to. <laughs> maybe be a little bit overboard with it, but no, I, I fortunately I haven't had that happen to me. Now that I said that it will, but. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've admitted what you fear most, it will come true. Uh, That's right. What's that called? The self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh yeah. That's right. No, I did. I did get a feature out of that. Uh, that puzzle. Privy was the name of that one, yeah. What does he mean by a failed birthday gift? Yeah, so it was, um, I think, I don't remember if they told me or if I had just figured out that they like German Whisper Ren Band puzzles. Mm -hmm. And they, usually when I ask uh, people what they like for their birthdays, I'll ask about difficulty. And I remember the first puzzle I set was like way far on the difficult, like too far mm -hmm. on the difficulty end. Um, but I like the deductions in it and I didn't want to like, I tried nerfing it a little bit and it just like, it was kind of bypassing most of the logic I had found. So I just decided to like, save it and then, uh, make a, a completely separate puzzle. And mm -hmm. I, I still sent them both to, to Melrog, uh, just to say like, Hey, here's your birthday puzzle. Here's your bonus birthday puzzle. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, the, the, the harder one ended up getting featured. Nice. Uh, yeah, it's it's it also kind of... has the funniest thumbnail <laughs> out of all of them. Because I I took privy as meaning it the puzzle looks like like in my mind it look kind of looks like two people like whispering uh -huh. to one another like the way that the lines met up. Yeah, and so I, I I usually try to name my puzzles kind of after how they look, and I was like, oh, I don't want to just call it whispers because that's you know not right. exactly a unique thing. So I was like, oh, I was trying to find synonyms for that, and privy came to mind. But uh, Mark, who solved it, took that as meaning like an outhouse. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the thumbnail is him just standing next to like an old timey like wooden outhouse. <laughs> I thought was great. <laughs> that is very funny. Yeah. yeah.
Um, I was going to say it's... I, I don't know if it's good or bad when you send someone like a birthday or a secret Santa puzzle and they're like, oh, this will take me months to solve. Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, right. okay. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I usually get nervous if like I haven't heard anything in like a week or two. Yeah, like did, did I overshoot different? Because I tend to overshoot difficulty on my yeah. puzzles anyway. Um, is there any specific puzzle that was important for, like your your journey or your development as a setter? Like one one that stands out. I think probably the biggest one for me was spaghetti on the wall. Um, this, it was probably near my, uh, one of my first 10 puzzles for sure. But that puzzle was, um, I had set two or three puzzles, I think before that. And it was just kind of like dabbling and setting, like, I wonder if I like this, like just playing around with stuff in the grid. And then, um, I was at that point watching a lot of Zeta math streams and he had pointed out sort of one of the. I'll call it secret properties of 159 puzzles uh, where any of the three cells in a, a three by three box have an, basically act like an entropic line just based on how the indexing works. And I hadn't realized that about 159 puzzles uh, before that stream. And so I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I was like, right around that time, I don't know where I had seen entropic lines puzzles, but maybe it was something else that ZetaMath was solving or something that I had found on. LMD. And I was like, I bet I could make a, a puzzle out of this. So, um, and this, this was uh, when I was kind of barely active in the CTC Discord, mostly just on Zeta Mass streams, and ended up setting that puzzle. Um, I think Playmaker found it, sent it to Navario, um, which is the first time I had even heard of Navario and, and seen their, his stream. So, saw that get solved there, saw it get solved on Zeta Mass stream. Mm -hmm. And that was also my first experience ever watching somebody solve one of my puzzles which I think is probably the, the thing that helped me the most is actually watching people solve puzzles. And I think a lot of people have had that same experience. And so around that time, the Skunk Works was working on an Entropic Lines puzzle pack. Mm -hmm. And Ron Planner actually reached out to me after solving that puzzle and said, hey, we're building this pack. Do you want to be involved with it? And so I got invited to the Skunk Works at that point. Um, this is, I think, before it was a completely... Uh, public server right and started workshopping puzzles like getting a lot more feedback on my puzzles than i ever did before you know you put stuff in the ctc testing and you are lucky if you get like anything more than a check mark under your puzzle sometimes mm -hmm. um and so this one was actually like you know 10 or 12 people like looking at it giving feedback on it streaming the solve of it like making sure everything worked giving some like suggestions um and so that was that was what really got me hooked on the hobby was kind of that experience of actually watching people solve something that I made and not just kind of imagining like, Oh yeah, I got, you know, I got a puzzle rated an LMD or, you know, I've got, you know, a, a nice comment once in a while, mm -hmm. actually having like a, a circle of people sort of uh, sharing opinions and doing things like that. So can you talk more about uh, for people who, who might not know, the benefit of watching someone solve your puzzle? Like, why is that so important? Yeah, there's a few things. So normally when you're getting uh, feedback on a puzzle, like if you're just posting it to, you know, the CTC Discord or wherever you end up posting it to get feedback, most people are going to solve it kind of on their own time. Mm -hmm. And they might send you a replay if they know how to do that or if they think to do that. Um, but a lot of times they'll just say, yeah, this is a, you know, two and a half out of five stars. And, you know, I like, you know, a couple of these cool steps and that's about all the feedback you get. Um, I think people in general um, in those, in those servers don't like giving negative feedback Gee, unless yeah. it's like obviously needed, you know, like uh, the puzzle is not unique or like I couldn't figure out how to solve this or something like that. So you're not getting a lot of constructive criticism. You're either getting, yep, this solves, and this is about the difficulty, or you're getting, no, this isn't unique, and really not a lot in between, except for some people. Um, but when you watch somebody solve your puzzles, number one, if it's if it's just one person, like they're usually talking through the thought process, what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. They're talking 
through like, oh, this, you know, this step was kind of gross. Like, you know, I didn't really expect to have to do all these different things or, you know, I really liked this step. I thought that was a cool step. Um, or you get uh, like a group solve where you get people talking back and forth and you maybe they find like a different break in or they find a different kind of bypass to what you were doing. So you, um, if you're paying attention during those, you can kind of think the way I, I approached it is I thought, you know, what are they looking at? when they're trying to solve my puzzle. Cause <laughs> spoiler alert, my puzzles tend to be a little messy on the grid. So mm -hmm. there's not always clear where you're supposed to look. Um, and so when that happens, you can kind of watch and say, Oh, this was a, this was a, a sticking point because they didn't know where to look because I didn't, you know, there was just too many different places to look in the grid or a, I needed to use some crazy chain to make progress. Um, there's always things when, I'm setting a puzzle. Like once, once you see a deduction, sometimes, sometimes you can't unsee it, and you end up like going forward with it anyway, even if it's something that you know is probably not realistic to expect the the solver to find. And that sort of stuff, when you start to see it over and over again as people are solving your puzzles, it it, it sort of provides a little bit of feedback that way to help you grow mm -hmm. as a, as a setter. Yeah, for and plus sure. you get to like meet people and discuss things, and maybe they know something about the constraint that you don't. Like I mentioned, Zeta Math mentioning that entropic property of one five nine. Yeah, I wouldn't have probably figured that out by myself necessarily. Maybe I would have, right. but um, you get kind of these shortcuts shown to you that you can then use in your setting, and you know it, it continues from there. Uh, actually, about story about round planer and set and solving live and the benefit of that which i'll just share quickly so one time he set uh lockout lines uh thing i think it was in lockout lines anti-night and i was uh looking at it and completely forgot that there was anti-night uh so i was solving yeah. for like 30 minutes and he's like don't you think you can use the anti-night somewhere here and I'm like, wait, <laughs> what? There's an anti night in this puzzle? I completely did not even register that. But yeah, we realized he was like, how did you get all this without the anti night? And we realized that there was a lot more going on in that setup of lockout lines than than we had previously than he had previously thought, uh, and that without yeah. without the um, the anti night there could be something real cool going on uh, mm -hmm. as well, which would make for probably a better puzzle. Uh, so then that that ended up being, I think like, I think it's called like ISS or something like that, like International Space Station. Uh, mm. I think Rom, Rom has yeah, that on cool. his, his, his uh, LMD. And that, that was a fun experience. Uh, anyways, yeah. getting back to something you said about a mess. So let's talk about aesthetics in puzzles. Like you're, you say your most puzzles are mostly a mess and looking around at, at sort of the grids around here, some of them are, are a bit messy, others not quite as much. What does a beautiful puzzle look like to you? I like to think that beauty isn't on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's definitely more for me, uh, heavily skewed towards the actual logical steps in the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and and that probably shows in my setting. I think my probably my harder puzzles tend to be a little bit more scattered or intimidating looking from on the face of it. And it's actually not something that I even noticed of my setting until like the past several months, like people have like mentioned that, you know, that to me. But yeah, to me, you know, a puzzle can be, you know, look super intimidating or it can look like really simple, but um, a, a nicely constructed puzzle that's like trivial necessarily isn't necessarily a beautiful puzzle to me. Um, it's something more that makes me learn something more about the constraint mm -hmm. or something that does something unexpected that, uh, you know, is, is, is interesting or something, you know, that's kind of what I think of as, as a beautiful puzzle. Um, as opposed to, you know, one that looks nice. Sometimes I'm not downplaying easy puzzles necessarily. Sometimes those can be just as beautiful, but um, it's definitely not about the aesthetics for me. Right. Yeah. I think sometimes there, there are, 
beautiful things about aesthetics like white room, for example, but then most of the time I, I, I tend to lean towards towards the, the logic as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think spaghetti on the wall is, an, is a good example of that, which is yeah. a bunch of random and traffic lines. And that's, that's exactly why I called it that. Right. Inspired by your, your children, of course. Um. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, when you're testing your own puzzles, are you, are you looking for like bypasses or do you not really care if there are like other ways to solve the puzzle? Uh, it depends on my mindset when mm -hmm. I'm, and, and probably the difficulty of the puzzle. Like if I'm, if I'm intentionally setting a one or two star puzzle, I'm usually looking for you back. I believe we are back. Nice. Just need to. Pop that out. Uh, da, da, da. Is YouTube connected? <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Can the people hear? Yeah, I just refreshed my my window, and it seems to okay, people okay. seem to be saying something. Nice. Okay, refresh, refresh. Oh wait, we should say that in the chat. Refresh page. Okay, everyone. It sounds like everyone. Okay, perfect. Yes. <laughs> All right, we're back. <laughs> Sorry, I I shouldn't have hung up on them. <laughs> <laughs> you got to upgrade. <laughs> I thought for a second I used to have them as my phone provider. So I was, they were like, oh, you can upgrade your plan. So I was like, oh, okay, uh, sure. And then I realized that I don't have them as my provider anymore. So I was like, wait, no, I don't want to hear about these plans. Like I, I, I have my own provider. <laughs> so then I hung up on them, like didn't even like say like, oh, goodbye. Uh, <laughs> so... I could understand we'll if they were guy. mad. <laughs> we'll show this guy. Turn <laughs> off his internet for a couple hours. See how he likes that. <laughs> uh, the uh, guy said, like, oh, well, it's was... never a bad idea to shop around. And then I just hung up. <laughs> 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 Whoops. <laughs> Anyways. Um, uh, yeah, I was talking about, um, I think, yeah grid ugly grids and right, or right. and then like finding bypasses in my puzzles yes I, th yes I think people probably heard that part of it yeah i i think i was about to say something before we before dropped crash. okay so i'm guessing that means that you got your point out um assuming that i i understood okay. the point <laughs> yeah uh i don't know let's go to helio Opelix. That's how you pronounce it before, right? He said it. He said you pronounce it right. So, uh, Heliopolix. 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 Okay, I'm gonna ingrain that in my brain. Uh, Heliopolix asks, "What's your favorite number of constraints to use in a puzzle?" Which is a very <laughs> specific, but actually quite interesting question. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually I saw his question in in the chat earlier. Um, most of the time, I feel like I'm using like three constraints in my puzzles. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if I necessarily have a favorite, but it seems to be the one that I defer to most. And that probably means like three actual constraints and not like two constraints plus a crop beat out at the end. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't ever really go into a puzzle thinking like, I need to limit my my puzzle to this many constraints. Uh, mm. Easier puzzles, I usually try to do that, unless it's something that's like standard. You know, um, if I'm experimenting with a constraint, I usually maybe just pick one other one. Or if I'm trying mm. to create something new, I'll try to pick one just to keep the focus on on the new thing that I'm trying to do. 
Um, but I do like setting puzzles with lots of weird constraints together that probably don't normally go together. Mm -hmm. That's part of the fun that I have with it is just trying trying new things like that. Right. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought about this question ever before, but it, it, it is an interesting one for sure. Yeah, it is also, I think, sometimes more challenging, at least for me, to try setting with just one constraint. Um, I've heard oh, a yeah. lot of people yeah. say, like, please no more arrow Sudoku's and, and things like that. But <laughs> I tend to fall on the other side of it. I think it is a good exercise because we all, I maybe not we all, but I tend to um, fall into these, I'll call it a trap of like trying to set more and more sort of eccentric or esoteric type puzzles. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, it's nice to take a step back and just try to like get back to basics and you know, try digging deeper into like one constraint or, or something like that to try to set something. Um, it was funny, like maybe last fall, I had set my first ever pure killer Sudoku after solving, you know, hundreds of them. I had never actually tried to set just a pure killer, even though I use killer in quite a few of my puzzles. Um, and yeah. I thought that was a fun experience, you know, just trying to, to, to try to build something without having many multiple constraints to work together to, to make deductions. Yeah, pure pure killer is is such a lovely setting exercise in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Definitely would recommend if uh, if um, if someone has not done that, it is it yeah. is good. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how many different types of deductions mm -hmm. you can put together with with two or three cages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how easy it is to find something that you've never seen before mm -hmm. anyways well not never seen before but in a different way you know. what sucks is when you see it in a different way but other other people just see it the same way as normal yeah yeah <laughs> and especially with something like killer like you make something yeah. and it's like oh that's really cool and like yeah this is like the 19th puzzle i solved this week with this idea <laughs> that, never, that never feels great but at least you kind of prove to yourself that you can yeah. set something with that Sure. I guess it gave me ideas ideas for other puzzles too. Like, hey, I could use this type of deduction with, you know, these these two constraints, which kind of behave mm -hmm. like killers. Right. That's interesting. Uh, we already talked about puzzle names, so we we can cross that off the list. Uh, duh, duh, duh. what's a piece of advice? I do you ask my kids to name my puzzles. Oh, too really? sometimes, by the way. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. They see. They always see things like I say, what does this puzzle look like? Or like, what would you call this? And they'll say something like that's half the time they'll say something that's just nonsense, but the other half they'll actually give me a good idea. Oh, nonsense makes a good puzzle title too. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, what piece of advice? Uh, oh, what is a piece of advice you received early on in your setting career that really helped you? And is there any advice that you'd like to offer others? Yeah, I think it probably wasn't super early, but it was something that really helped me was, uh, I think it may, I don't remember exactly where I heard it or who, who gave it mm -hmm. to me, but it was along the lines of, you know, kind of what we were just talking about with making really complicated puzzles and trying to make something that's cool because it's complicated isn't always the best approach. Yeah. Um, you know, like shoving five constraints in a grid or like making some really obscure rule set that like, forces everything to happen, mm -hmm. um, trying to back off and, and make it so it doesn't take the solver 35 minutes to understand your rule set. Um, and just trying to set something simple that mm -hmm. has like interesting ideas in it. And, and also, um, sort of related to that is, um, trying to set puzzles that use sort of, especially with new constraints, puzzles that use the same type of deductions in different ways, rather than trying to set a puzzle that uses 15, 20 different deduction types, like some classic Sudoku techniques and like a bunch of stuff, just because it makes it a little bit scattered. And so trying to focus the solve path, I think has helped me a lot. Um, and, and you can always save the other deductions for another puzzle. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a time and place for, you know, complicated ideas and, you know, but that, that I think for me, making sure that that wasn't a focus for every puzzle that I made helped me a lot in trying to focus and, and sort of come up with ideas that don't rely on complicated rules. Mm -hmm. 
uh, speaking of complicated rules, do you feel like you're good at writing the rules to your own puzzles? Um, I'm getting better. Uh, I always ask specifically when I'm asking for someone to test my puzzle, like, can you please look at the rules and make sure that they make sense? Like what, what doesn't make sense? What could be clarified? Mm -hmm. um, I know if, if anyone who's watched Remster's stream, I don't know other people do this too, but um, they're very big on making sure the rules are very clear so that anybody could pick the puzzle up and understand what's going on. Maybe it's complicated and they couldn't find the logic, but they could, should at least know what the constraints do. Right. Um, yeah. And so I've gotten better at it um, over time. I'm, I also, part of my work is technical writing. So I, I, I feel like I've gotten a lot better at it since I started that part of my career. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a work in progress. I can always get better and always look for feedback, even if I think it's, you know, nailed down, especially with indexing. <laughs> I think that's one, one type of rule set that a certain type of brain or a certain type of mind understands things way more easily than others do. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I, um, I started to include more visual examples in the puzzles I publish to help with that. Cause you know, to, to kind of accommodate visual learners as well. Right. I don't think anybody picked up this hobby because they were a master at writing rules. So no, <laughs> we all learn I, from, we learn from how people interpret things we write. Well, only, uh, Henry PI. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But thankfully he can police the rest of us. So, um, <laughs> Henry's great. Uh, if you could be interviewed by a different person in the puzzling community, who would you like to be interviewed by? Mm. That's a good question. It's probably somebody who doesn't. Mm, that's a really good question. I know the answer. It's not going to make people happy. <laughs> I would love to hear what Scorp thinks about my puzzles, really. <laughs> no, I don't. I that don't would be an that, epic interview. That would be. But I don't idea. think that'll happen. Yeah. I seriously doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> but but really, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Probably somebody like. Uh, somebody that actually. Um, is entrenched in sort of that in, in rule sets and somebody that would interview based on the side of puzzles that like the actual like accessibility for puzzles mm -hmm. and like how do you make a puzzle um solvable or well, not solvable but understandable by someone who's never solved, solved the sudoku before like right. somebody who's actually yeah. an expert in that and could and could dive into those conversations i think would be interesting to hear yeah that would be interesting you know i want to hear that interview um <laughs> <laughs> uh talk us through the emotions that you feel when you start setting a puzzle usually it depends on what i'm what i'm doing usually if i'm solving uh setting a birthday puzzle uh it's a mixture of like excitement and a lot of nervousness because mm -hmm. like i really want the person to to get something that they enjoy and i'm a lot more critical of my puzzles when i set like that right um, versus if it's something like in, in discord server, like in the skunk works, we'll, during some of the live cells, we'll start to have discussions of like really cursed rule sets or like really weird ideas that people have. And so trying to set something like that, it's more of, uh, almost kind of like you're doing this just to prove that you can do something. And so you've got like, <laughs> I bet I could make this puzzle and make it not cursed. And like, so you've got this sort of chip on your shoulder while you're setting it. Right. So I think it's a little bit of a mix of both, but mm -hmm. I think I prefer the sort of, um, setting for individual people and just having that kind of like excited nervousness while you're trying to set a puzzle like that. Right. Keeps it fun. Uh, I guess related to the, the idea of making something ridiculous playmaker asked what is the most bs rule set you've ever thought about once and actually said it well 
I guess there's a couple. So the 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 most yeah. BS singular rule set, mm -hmm. like just on its own, has to be the psycho look and say puzzles. Um, <laughs> just because it, it mixes up like so many different weird thoughts about Sudoku, uh -huh. like with that box indexing and also look and like look and say isn't necessarily a wild constraint, but it's just something that not a lot of people are used to. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what uh, I think micro study said in the intro, like nobody asked for this. <laughs> <laughs> so like, that's probably the one that I've said, like, I've said handful puzzles, some with um, Bill Sita and, um, you know, some other people have actually picked up puzzles like Heliopolis and Glum Hippo started setting some puzzles with that constraint too, which was really cool. Um, so it ended up having a little bit of legs. It got a CTC feature, which Mark absolutely hated that puzzle, but <laughs> uh, it's fine. <laughs> uh, but definitely the most BS puzzle that I've ever set is in the throes of chaos. My, um, the puzzle I set for a secret Satan this past winter. Mm -hmm. um, it has three solves and it'll probably stay that way. Um, and I think the person I set it for still hasn't solved it. Um, oh. But <laughs> yeah. the, the prompt that they sent was a lot of um, constraints that I had never heard of, or a lot of pencil puzzle genres that I had never heard of before, like Cairo, um, Stowe Stone, a lot of these, like, they're, they're not necessarily obscure genres, but they're just ones I had never set with. Mm. Um, and another one was Kalkidoku, which I thought, you know, that's something that's at least close to killer. And I've, I've set quite a few killer puzzles, so I can probably make something like that work. And so, uh, I started looking into Cairo. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but it's basically one where you move, you have regions in the grid and you have to move clues into the region so that each region has exactly one clue. But the, as you move the clues, they leave a path behind them and none of the other clues can cross that path. So you have to end up, it's kind of ends up being like a, a like a, a placement puzzle where you're moving stuff around the grid and, and making it, uh, all fit into the different regions. And so I said, what if I made a Kalkidoku puzzle where the clues were in the grid and you didn't know what region they belonged to, and so you had to move them into the regions? So I started setting it, and I was like, they also like Shimaguni, and I, I like Shimaguni, so I want to make the regions also have, like, follow Shimaguni rules So as I'm setting this puzzle. Because um, it's Secret Satan, I'm in the mood to make something, like, way more wild than I would never make for mm -hmm. a, a, puzzle, a puzzle I'd publish. And so a lot of times my approach for something like killer is I'll leave the clues sort of as ambiguous as I can. I do this with sandwich. I do this with a lot of genres that need like sums. Um, I'll leave it as ambiguous as I can. Maybe put like a greater than 10 clue or like something like that, or I know it's a double digit clue and go as long as I can uh, setting the puzzle without defining that clue. Um, number one, I think it's interesting to set like that. And number two, um, it's, the puzzles are less easy, to, less likely to break halfway yeah. through if you haven't defined the clue yet. You can kind of make it what you want when it's convenient. Um, and the funny thing about this puzzle was uh, I got about to the halfway through all of the shading and region building and clue moving without defining any clues. <laughs> and I said, why don't I make it a cipher? <laughs> And so the whole okay. back half of the puzzle, or the best back two thirds of the puzzle, because the digits weren't placed yet, was just keeping them ciphered and trying to figure out ways to def uh, maintain ambiguity throughout the whole puzzle. And it requires <laughs> some very cursed steps, or, or one cursed step in particular, to figure out what all the digits are. Uh, but that was kind of how that that puzzle came to be. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah i was i was surprised that i was able to like i didn't expect or, or necessarily want to maintain ambiguity like that but i was just laughing while i was setting that puzzle like out loud to myself <laughs> like i could i can keep this ambiguous the whole time can't i <laughs> so it was fun i love how but again, it's... three people who solved it writes the rules are quite weird <laughs> like yeah. yes yeah <laughs> they're like paragraph long yeah, there's very a, dense. a surprising number of comments on my LMD page saying things like delightfully weird or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I've sort of subconsciously adopted that into my persona as a setter. Hmm. Just do some weird stuff and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, Playmaker is right. At least there's no toroidal constraints in that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, we should ask about Wisteria's question because it's related to this secret Satan stuff. Uh, Wisteria mm -hmm. asks, you've set evil pencil puzzles for Secret Satan, one star killers for artisanal Sudoku, and seemingly everything in between. Do you prefer setting with or without a goal in mind? Yeah. Um, I, I think I prefer setting without a goal in mind. Uh, I mentioned before, I really like just experimenting with the grids and just seeing kind of what type of logic is possible when you combine two constraints together. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a lot more freeing when you, uh, when you can set something like that, then, um, you know, if, if you're really trying to restrict yourself to like anything more specific than that. Right. Um, the exception I think is, you know, if I'm setting something for artisanal Sudoku, uh, which I've done a couple times, the goal is to make a puzzle kind of using more simple constraints and um, trying to keep it more on like the one star side. So making something really easy. And so in those cases, I, I find it easier to set when I have like, what kind of deduction do I want to have the solver make at the beginning of the puzzle? And then try to set something up that sort of forces that deduction. I, I talked about that a little before where I think sometimes good, easier puzzles are ones that are more focused that way mm -hmm. where the, the solver can make, make a deduction and then use it in a few different ways. Right. And so I, I don't think it's more so that I have more of a goal. I just have more of a framework of, you know, I don't want to make this difficult. So instead of picking the constraints, I'm just going to pick what deduction I want to try to, or what theme I want to do. Like if it's something like virtual pairs or, you know, something like that and, and just build something around that. Fun. Yeah. That's a good way to say it. Uh, so we've talked a lot about what you, what you do. KNT is kind of asking the other way around. What do you want to improve at most as a setter? Yeah, th there's a long answer to this yeah. <laughs> because there's a lot of things I want to improve at. Uh, I That's mentioned good. before being like kind of always in a learner mindset. So I, I never think I've like necessarily mastered anything. So, mm -hmm. but the thing that I, I've really been focusing on um, I mentioned a little before is sort of trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, tighten up, like tighten up the solve paths or like tighten up the, um, the rule sets and things so that the, they're less complex just for the complexity sake. Right. But also trying to find like deeper deductions or deeper understanding of like exactly how mm -hmm. constraints interact. Like, uh, and I still do this, but earlier when I was setting, I, I relied more on like geometric deductions, like these, this killer cage and this Renban interact this way because of how I drew them in the grid. Um, but mm -hmm. trying to find more like some basic properties of how those constraints actually work, that's kind of irrespective of how they're placed um, or, you know, mm -hmm. that could be flexible, that could be used in different ways. Right. Um, there's a lot of setters out there that I think do a really good job of that. And so it's just something that I've tried to focus on. Um, mostly by actually solving more difficult puzzles and, and trying to, you know, stop and ask why things are actually interacting the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, one way that's helped with this, and I think it's actually KNT maybe who mentioned it and probably others on one of your interviews with them, is that they just started like throwing away puzzles that they had started setting and it's just like starting over um, with a new grid. and and kind of learning or using what you've learned from that setting that first puzzle and making kind of a more polished version of that puzzle. Yeah. And I actually, actually did this by accident the first time. Um, mm. Speaking of birthday puzzles, it was the <laughs> birthday puzzle I set for math pesto in 2022 um, where I was setting a puzzle on my laptop and didn't realize it was unplugged and got near the end of it. And my computer shut down and I, it was setting in pen puzzle, So I lost the entire puzzle. Um, and so I had to go back and try to recreate, I had the break in kind of already, but none of the other rest of the mid solve. Right. And I found when I was setting the mid solve, like I had discovered some things about the constraints as I was setting the first time, but I found that I was actually able to kind of more deliberately put those things into the puzzle 
mm -hmm. um, the second time around. And I think it actually made the solve path a lot cleaner and actually like, I, I think was a better puzzle anyway. I was a lot happier with it. Yeah. I mean, just, yeah, Paula Jovial and just close the tab. Yeah. Walk away. Exactly. Uh, and it's, it's, hurt me. it's funny because I think <laughs> so, some people probably do that in a different way. And I'm not mm -hmm. advocating necessarily to do, like throw away your puzzles. I mean, maybe it's a good exercise to do to help uh, practice like detaching yourself from, you know, certain ideas and, and, and trying to see if you can do something better. But um, I tend to be someone like, once I set with a rule set, I don't often set a lot of puzzles with those rule sets. Yeah. I'll set like one or two and then try something else. And so I think if you set like 10 German Whisper Ranban puzzles, you'll kind of end up with, by the time you're done, you'll end up with a more refined puzzle. You don't necessarily have to throw all the other ones away. I'm a big advocate right. for just, you know, put stuff out there, let people give you feedback on it. And if it's terrible, it's terrible. If it's not, you know, you found some something cool, then share that with people, you know. Mm -hmm. Detach yourself from the percentage on your LMD page if you can. Right. <laughs> uh, I don't very, I don't ask this very often, but how how important are are the LMD ratings to you? <laughs> Almost not at all. Um, it does tell you, I think, from the standpoint of I probably could have something done something better with this puzzle. Um, like if my puzzle gets rated at like an 80% or something like that, mm -hmm. um, I say, well, there's probably something I could have done to make this clear. I wonder what it was. Maybe I'll ask someone to solve it, um, you know, live if I haven't watched that already. See like what could, what, what was unclear? What could I have done better? Maybe it was something that's just a genre that people don't tend to like. So, right. you know, sometimes there's not a lot you can do with it. Um, but I think apart from that like i try not like if i put something again i'm 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 setting a lot of weird things sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> and things that i know maybe not be always aesthetically pleasing so if it gets rated a little bit lower than some of my other puzzles you know i don't i try not to let that bother me uh, in my mind the number one thing that ratings are good for is getting on ctc um and that's really the only thing apart from what i said about just kind of getting some feedback on quality um, that it really matters for. Mm -hmm. um, it's always cool to get a hundred percent puzzle. Like I'm, I'm not going to downplay that. I'm not going to say I don't have any ego whatsoever about my puzzles <laughs> because I do, but I think it's a lot healthier if you go in with that mindset of they didn't like, maybe they rated my puzzle lower than I would have hoped. What can I learn from this rather than saying, Oh, I'm a terrible setter because this puzzle is a 75%. Number one, 75% yeah. is above the average rating. So more people right. liked your puzzle than not. Um, but I think that's a lot healthier mindset mm -hmm. um, to go in with. For sure. Um, how do you overcome creative blocks when designing puzzles? That's really hard because <laughs> it happens a lot. Um, I tend to kind of go in waves with like creativity. So I'll set five or 10 puzzles in a month. And then sometimes I'll go two, three puzzles without having any really good ideas or inspiration. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody works through it a little bit differently. I prefer to just take breaks um, and, and completely stop thinking about setting puzzles when I start to get into setter's block and just start, even stop solving puzzles sometimes and just kind of, you know, watch other people solve things or, um, you know, completely step away from the hobby for like a week just to kind of refresh and, you know, try, uh, try to give myself a break from constantly thinking about setting something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how some of the content creators who like make puzzles like routinely can can do it because I'm, I'm the type of person where if I get stuck on something, it's really hard for me to escape that without <clears throat> sort of completely stepping away from it for a while. Right. Yeah, I I definitely feel that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, are there any puzzle genres or variants you haven't explored yet, but would like to in the future? Yeah, I mean, there's quite a few. Um, I know I've done, I, I've started getting more into pencil puzzles recently and actually trying to set like 
pure pencil puzzles and not Sudoku hybrids. Right. Um, so there's a few, like, I, I really enjoy solving, like, uh, Shimaguni Hiyawake, if I'm pronouncing that right, a lot of the shading genres. Um, so I've been trying to get into actually trying to set those just sort of pure hybrids. Right. Um, recently just like published my first like pure Masu puzzle um, over on Logic Masters India. Um, just as an exercise, just to try to do something a little bit different. And that's probably part of related to the creativity piece is just try doing something completely different and see what, what inspires you there. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. A lot of people are saying Uban in the chat or a couple of people are saying that. <laughs> I've tried many times. That is not something that my brain understands. <laughs> Same. Uh, is it Uban or Uban? Because I've been saying Uban. Maybe. I go by the, well, I don't know if it's the real German pronunciation, but my <laughs> high school, my three years of high school German. <laughs> Better than me. Okay. I, I don't know who's right. <laughs> uh, are there any techniques, deductions, or clue configurations that you've been trying to set a puzzle around, or maybe even genres or variants, but they keep eluding you, like you can never finish something with it? Hmm. Nothing really stands out. I mean, a, a lot of the like single variant puzzles are things that I haven't really necessarily been successful with. Um, I do have a couple ideas for puzzles that I, I've tried playing around with and just like haven't found anything interesting with. So right. I, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with like Lemon Sudoku, or maybe they're not, but um, where the lemons is kind of like basically arrows. Right. Um, with pills in the middle and they end up being lemons and trying to do stuff with that outside the grid. Like with like number of oh, rooms okay. or different things like that. Hmm. Um, and that was just off of like a, kind of a weird conversation that we were having over, I think, in the Skunk Works at some point. Um, so there's, there's things like that where like, oh, it seems like a cool idea. And then you sit down with it and it's like, yeah, I, I can't find anything interesting with this. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's better just to let those things go. But um, every once in a while, like I have, you know, a bunch of, partially finished puzzles on my browser. So I'll like open it up and see if I can find something else with it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I, I go far too long before closing puzzles that have no chance of seeing the lift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, maybe one day I'll think of something that I'll like, yeah. that'll, that'll make it seem interesting, but no, no less. <laughs> Uh, are there, oh, I guess this is kind of similar to, uh, I don't know, it's not. Agent asked, are there any underrated puzzle genres slash rule sets that you wish would be set or solved more often? Yeah. Um, for like Sudoku constraints, I really like search nine puzzles. Um, if people are familiar with that, it's basically you have arrows in the grid oh, pointing yeah. In, yeah, I remember like, orthogonally, yeah. and the digit you put in on the arrow will tell you where the nine is in that row or column, like how many cells away it is. Right. And uh, Rossellini, uh, Rossini, which is the, the genre where you have arrows outside the grid and it tells you the, the, uh, whether the, clue, the digits in the first three cells of that row or column ascend or descend. And there's a negative constraint. So like, if you don't have an arrow, then they can't completely ascend or completely descend. Oh, why do you uh, want people to set more of those? Those are so awful. <laughs> there's really, I think there's really interesting uh, okay. possibilities with some, some of those, like probably not like pure Rossini puzzles, but okay, okay. Um, combining Rossini with something else. Um, Glum Hippo just published a puzzle. I'll, I'll be a little biased with the psycho look and say, uh, but combining that with Rossini, it actually caused some pretty cool interactions. Okay. So just things that I think would be helpful to explore. Um, with Search 9, I made um, a couple puzzles with that. Uh, one of them I made for Adventure uh, Ranks uh, series, the six by sixes. Right. So it was a Search 6, a Search 6 puzzle. And it actually a little bit of a funny story. Um, Bremster was doing a stream where he was solving some of the adventure series and got to my puzzle. 
And there was a point in the solve where there was like an arrow pointing down and it's in the second row. And he ended up pencil marking sixes in row one above it. And so he had a six behind the arrow and didn't see it for a little while. And then eventually kind of made a comment like, oh, well, duh, like sixes can't go behind the arrows. And I thought to myself, or can they? And so I ended up setting a couple of puzzles with negators and search nine, hmm. where the, the nine can be behind the arrow in, in the puzzle. So uh, backfire is one. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what the other one is, uh, but I thought that was something that was pretty cool. So yeah. just trying to come up with some interesting ways to implement some of these. They're, they're mostly genres, I think, that show up in competition puzzles. Right. Um, and so they sort of get a bad rap for just kind of being like this sort of like high pressure and like sort of maybe uninteresting or not really set for the purpose of being an interesting puzzle, but set for the purpose of being a competitive puzzle. And I think bringing some of those genres into other variants, I think is interesting. Yeah. I, I definitely feel that some of these like, like rank, rank cages or like, or the, the set nine ones or or whatnot could be more interesting than just another like German whispers friend band sort of thing again and again and yeah. again and again. <laughs> yeah, it, it's like yeah, just trying to find some other ways to to force things or some other ways to make similar deductions is always yeah. interesting. And then for pen uh, for pencil puzzles for from agents question, um, land vermeshung is or land measurement. Mm -hmm. really obscure, probably obscure genre. There's only maybe five or six puzzles on LMD with that. I've set, um, I've set two of them, um, always combined with some sort of uh, deconstruction or some other genre, but um, I really like that. And I, I know a few people have started setting puzzles and, and playing around with it, different ideas with it. I think that would end up being pretty cool. Um, what is one of my puzzles with that? I think, um, what's the most recent one I did? I found one. Rhizome. Rhizome is one, but if you found one. Yeah, I found one. Rhizome. I yeah. foolishly Googled land measurement and then realized that <laughs> You're that not gonna get is much not there. going to be any puzzles. <laughs> yeah. There's um there's some really <laughs> difficult <laughs> there's some really difficult puzzles with that genre on LMD. There's not a lot of like approachable intro puzzles for that genre. I think the only reason I even knew about it was the gap series that was on the CTC Discord. I think Tragana set one hmm. a couple of years ago that I saw that I thought was interesting, so started playing with it. Worth a shot. I think there's a couple of two star ones in LMD if anyone's interested in trying them, but they're the, the 2009 two-star LMD puzzles, so they're definitely not like, I think they're probably closer to three or four sometimes. Right. Cool. Um... Oh yeah, A38 is great too, Glum Hippo mentions. <laughs> Heard that mentioned before by Meg, so I think. Uh, David Ratner asked, do you children solve your six by sixes or other setters, or I guess maybe a mix of both? Uh, they don't solve mine necessarily, but they have a couple of uh, books that we found right. that were kind of geared more towards kids. So um, they're still working through those and being six and eight, their attention span isn't always the greatest. <laughs> so they haven't... Um, really, really gotten into the hobby, but they are showing interest in it. And, you know, when, if I'm sitting down like with a puzzle or something, sometimes they'll, like, they'll want to sit down with me and do it. Mm -hmm. So not yet. But eventually I'll get them into like adventure or something, go that series right. and see how they do. <laughs> and Pal, I had another, an interesting question in the chat here that we ignored, but I have it here saved. Do you have an easier time making logic you like in an easy or hard puzzle? Um, I actually think I have a fairly easy time in either case. Hmm. Um, I can make, uh, I feel like I can make interesting things in easier puzzles. Uh, as I mentioned before, for me, when I set those, it's more about limiting the 
types of deductions in those puzzles. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's an interesting deduction that I use, you know, eight or 10 times throughout the solve path, um, rather than just making like a lot of, a lot of more trivial deductions. Um, and then in harder puzzles, it's obviously more complex. And so you can use a lot more different techniques and, and if, if your goal is to make a harder puzzle. So I right. think I, um, I enjoy and I, um, I think both types of things come easier. I think it's harder for me to um, make sure that the easy puzzle I'm trying to set doesn't become a difficult puzzle <laughs> rather than uh, like having a harder time, like actually making the steps interesting. Right. That makes sense. Uh, tch -tch. Trying to find this this question, but I think I know what the question is. Uh, are there any setters that you feel that your style is very similar to? Um, I know a lot of setters who I sort of emulated when I started setting and have rubbed off on me. Um, Tallcat probably being the first one. Um, there's a puzzle on my page, one of, I think maybe second or some, like one of my earlier puzzles called Beep Beep that was based on one of his puzzles, which he had a how I set uh, um, video on from CTC that I had watched. And I was like, oh, actually when I was watching that, if you, um, I can't see on my stream if you have that puzzle up, but there's the um, the, the um, between line shape that kind of looks like, almost like the bumper of a Jeep. Right. And, yeah. and talk at the original puzzle. And my son saw me watching this video. I was like, oh, it's a Jeep. And I looked at it and I was like, I guess it kind of looks like the headlights of a Jeep. And so then I made a puzzle <laughs> <laughs> that looked like a Jeep for that. Um, and so a lot of those types of deductions were things that kind of I was exposed to early on in setting. Uh, sort of that. And then um, people like I solved a lot of puzzles from people like Math Pesto. Um, and there's actually a lot of different setters that have inspired me, like watching a lot of the puzzles being solved on ZetaMath's channel, I think. Um, I've tried to emulate like a little bit of um, the different things that I've liked out of those puzzles. And then also, I think, um, setting up like a lot of birthday puzzles where I'm trying to emulate that setter, right. like kind of puzzles that I think they would like setting, I think has helped me kind of get a lot of different types of inspiration in how I approach it. Hmm. It was funny because before this interview, I was trying to think of like, what is my style of setting? And I'm not sure I like have a defined style. Right. Um, that's why I think it's more like experimental. Like I just kind of see what, what I can find and then sort of present that as a puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, do you enjoy solving or setting more? I probably... I probably enjoy setting more lately, um, but that changes, I think, month to month, basically. Some, it it kind of depends on, because right. they're so similar activities, um, I'm focusing a lot more and, and sort of pushing myself to improve as a solver as well. Mm -hmm. So picking up a lot of harder puzzles. And so sometimes that can, that can lead to burnout pretty easily right. <laughs> after a while. And so then at the moment, like I've, I've gone through that phase of, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put the five star puzzles down and then just start trying to set some stuff that comes to mind. Um, so I think, yeah, I, overall, I probably enjoy solving a little bit more, um, but I, I don't think I would enjoy it as much if I didn't also set puzzles. Uh, talk us through the emotions that you feel when you're starting to solve like one of those five star puzzles. <laughs> yeah. Um, now that I've, I've gotten a lot more uh, comfortable with it, it's it's more uh, less daunting than it, it was before. Um, it's more just about like trying to get in the setter's mind of, you know, what were they going for with this, or like how how did they approach this when they were setting the puzzle? And so when when trying to improve and, and solving these types of difficult puzzles, it's it's trying to be in the mindset of okay, if I don't solve this. You know, I'm not like a failure of a solver. I'm right. I'm trying to do something that I've never done before. 
Um, but after a while, like it does kind of get a little defeating. And so you kind of have to step away once you get to that point and just say, you know, I'm going to take a break from this for a while and then come back to it. Um, you know, I'm not, this isn't necessarily something that I absolutely have to do. It's just something that I'm trying to do to improve. So yeah, you, you try to try to be a little bit de um, detached from the failure side of things and then try to learn something, you know, maybe you can't reach out to the setter, try to get some hints for it. Like what, what were they, what was their mindset? What was the intended deduction and try to internalize that. Right. Yeah. For sure. Uh, what's your biggest puzzling regret? Any puzzle you'd like to redo or take back? I don't think I have any. Um, no regrets. Most, like I said before, <laughs> most of the yeah, no regrets. Uh, most of the puzzles that I've said, I, I mentioned before, like I'm more, um, I'm more apt to just put something out there mm -hmm. than I am to like kind of overthink it and and try to make it perfect before I present it. Right. Um, I would rather just see what people think and you know, maybe somebody will enjoy it a lot. And there's, there's kind of an audience for everything out there, so you know, I'm I'm, I'm less likely to kind of hate a puzzle that I made. If I hate a puzzle I made, I'm just going to throw it away. No one's going to see it. Right. <laughs> but um, if I if I enjoyed setting it and if I enjoyed, um, you know, the process of it, then, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll put it out there. Yeah. I'm a little less selective than some people are about the LMD page. I go, I think almost everything that I've ever said is on there. Yeah. It might turn into your biggest puzzling regret that you told. Uh, everyone on the stream today that your name is actually dumb idiot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> I was trying to make people forget because we lost the stream for a while, but <laughs> that's a really good story, though. Uh, yeah. I definitely wouldn't have guessed that if you had given me a million guesses to figure out what your name was. <laughs> uh, do you have a puzzling pet peeve? Something that you see in puzzles that annoys you or a specific variant that annoys you? Uban annoys me <laughs> to no end. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people on, like, I've tried streaming it just like, you know, it's just something that there's some kind of a, a wall in my brain that can't get past some of the deductions, but right. um, not that I dislike it, but it's just, you know, the pet peeve is that I'm, I'm unable to solve it. And I'm a very stubborn mm -hmm. person when it comes to these things. And so I was like, eventually I'll get it. I don't know when it's going to be, but um, that's one that I think probably is my nemesis at this point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've tried as well and haven't had very much success. Reading through that, uh, <laughs> what was it? Woofers who made uh, Woofers FG who made the. Oh, the guide, yeah. The guide. I read some of those points, and it's like, and now you can clearly see that the, I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. What? What? Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> the same way I read that, and I was like, I, this is the, as, it, the, the nice thing about that guide is it makes it very obvious where I, I kind of lost the train. Yes. And so, like, pun intended. Yeah. And so, it's like page five yeah. or something. <laughs> mm hmm. It's just like, I'll okay, get I, I understood everything up until that thing, and yeah. I have absolutely no clue what that means. Uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, who is someone who you'd like to see interviewed who isn't like on the docket to be interviewed? Who isn't on the docket? Um, hmm. I'm trying to think also of who, who there are people on there that haven't gotten the votes that I want to see too, but. Right, sure. Yeah. Um, or, yeah, I mean, you can answer uh, someone yeah. who hasn't gotten the votes too. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, for me, it's, uh, I'll, I'll answer Chameleon who has, doesn't have the votes yet. I'll put a plug in for him. Yeah. Uh, just the, the level of innovation I think mm -hmm. that he has and is able to kind of like, like implement technology to do things um, but just these ideas there, I think, you know, it would be great to see him interviewed. He, I yeah, mean, he was sure. like instrumental in making my first CTC feature, even a puzzle, right, you know, true. with um, the, the Yagile and Fog puzzle. So mm -hmm. I would like to see that. Yeah. Chameleon's definitely someone I'd like to interview. So. 
yeah uh, and I, I i hate to give a name and like leave anyone out yeah, but yeah. like just you know that's yeah. the first name that popped into my mind um i feel like i moved on from with Siri's second question too early because i think it's related to the first one but i think i feel like we've already answered it so i'm gonna move on from it uh Palfly asked, what are your shortest and longest times to set a puzzle? Yeah, shortest time um, outside of speed setting contests is mm -hmm. probably about two hours. Um, there was a puzzle I had made early on. Um, I don't think I ever I ended up ever publishing it, actually. Um, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but... Uh, it was just like a, a couple of different constraints that I had a break in idea for mm -hmm. and just like the puzzle just kind of flowed. And I think it, it mostly resolved itself. And then I ended up, oh, it was a birthday puzzle. That's why it's not published. <laughs> um, and it just sort of flowed from start to finish. And I was like, oh, I, I kind of like the break in and the, you know, the, what ended up happening with the rest of the grid, it, it worked out kind of in a lucky way that I ended up keeping the puzzle as it was. And it was sort of intended to be sort of like a, an easier level puzzle. So I was pretty happy with it. Right. Um, that that's few and far between for me, though. I don't tend to get that lucky with puzzles. Um, my longest puzzle is Origin, the coordinate arrow puzzle um, that I set, which was something over a hundred hours uh, to set that puzzle. I can imagine over the course of maybe like it was like six months. Um, and the kind of story behind that is Pietato had made a. Uh, secret Satan gift for me two years ago. That was a uh, coordinate arrows double doubler puzzle, mm -hmm. um, which uh, is called Hell's Coordinates. And it was just it was one of those like it was the first like five star puzzle that I had solved that I really like. Kind of had these like aha moments because like, mm -hmm. before that I really hadn't solved a lot of five star puzzles. And I thought you know there's kind of this global break in with it, and like you had to understand. This is what I was talking about before. You had to understand a lot of what was going on with the constraint before you could make any progress whatsoever. And I thought um, at the time I was playing with like negators with those search nine puzzles. And I was like wondering to myself if I could set a coordinate arrows puzzle with negators in it. <laughs> and the original idea ended up being far, far and away what it ended up being in the final puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, I think I threw like 10 or 12 versions of that puzzle out. Um, before I kind of realized like what I could actually do with that and try to make something where basically you have to use every single clue in that puzzle in order to make a deduction that you need to break into it. Um, so it was, it, it, I think it was well worth the time. I wasn't really willing to to publish that puzzle until I, I had that sort of break in uh, ready for it. And then finding the break in, there was another many, many hours of trying to find a grid that wasn't broken. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like, it was one of those things where if you moved a clue, it broke the whole puzzle. Like you had to restart from the beginning because as soon as you move something, it changed all of the other deductions you already made. And so there was very, very few um, ways that you could actually set that puzzle up. Um, and you could never test whether it worked until you actually got the break and got the grid put together and then got two thirds of the way through the puzzle. Right. Um, and I'm not, I'm not one who really has like programming skills to write solvers or something like that. So um, I kind of had to rely on brute force a little bit. But yeah. I ended up, that's probably the most, most proud um, I am of any of my puzzles is that one. So, sometimes with these things where you, you just move one little thing and then it breaks the whole, whole rest of the puzzle. I'm like astounded that they're able to get set. Because sometimes it's like the layering of the different things. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And I knew I was going to be in for a, something like that with the way I wanted to set the puzzle up. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was worth it. And like I said, it, I, it, it took me like six or seven months to actually set that puzzle on and off. So it's the, I, th I thought it was worth waiting for. You have resilience. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Stubbornness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Daniel Silverstone asked, what is your favorite number to use in a puzzle constraint? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That's an interesting. I actually I saw that question and I started looking through my puzzles. Like I use a lot of killer, right? Um, and it seems like my favorite number is thirteen. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, and I think it's because usually when I'm putting like killer cages in puzzles, I'm doing a lot of like geometry with them, right? Where I'm trying to force like virtual pairs, or I'm trying to force like where specific digits can go mm -hmm. in a in an area, and so. Um, I like to set up things that use entrop entropy too. Mm -hmm. So 13 is kind of nice because you have like one middle entropy, one high entropy digit in it. Mm -hmm. And so you can kind of force the location of some of those that way. Um, also, my first uh, secret Satan puzzle I had set for Faluda, uh, not this past year, but the year before. Um, I had done another wild idea, which was probably second place in uh, Playmaker's question about most BS rule sets. <laughs> but it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the the title of that puzzle, but it's the one where I use, um, uh, it's a deconstruction anti-night killer puzzle that also uses connect the dots, <laughs> which is a really wild constraint. Uh, let me see if I can find what it's called for you. Uh, Oh, I found it. It's the final test. The final test, yeah. And so you can see the example grid, like what you're in for with this puzzle. But um, I, I realized, too, <laughs> that in the spirit of Secret Satan, I made it so that if a, did, uh, a cell in the killer cage was not part of a, one of the 3 by 3 regions, it had a value of 13. Um, and so that, that's probably my favorite number to use, or the one I use most, most often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting. You just had to add anti night in there, like <laughs> I did. <laughs> it's probably I've heard people like right. the way I use anti night. I love anti night. It's one of my favorite constraints, which is not a popular opinion. Yeah, but I tend to use it more to force uh -huh. geometry than I do. I try to keep it not as much of a scanning slog as some. So right. I feel like deconstruction. Like you're probably doing more deconstruction scanning than you are anti night scanning oh, in that yeah, case. Probably. Yeah. Deconstruction scanning is is something else for sure. It is. <laughs> Very similar to irregular. Yeah, a lot of wild leftover type stuff. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Uh da, da, da. Oh, thanks, Clark. That's that's not okay. That's a really sharp claw. <laughs> You're gonna kill me. <laughs> Uh, what makes you want to solve something versus not want to solve it? Hmm. I don't know. Probably there's not really a lot of puzzles that I don't want to solve. I mean, there's some genres um, that I don't necessarily like gravitate towards. Like I'm not either strong at or just yeah. ones that I don't really find interesting. Like if it's a pure non-consecutive puzzle, I'm probably not going to like jump to try to solve it. Yeah. Um, if I'm asked to solve it, I, I, you know, to test it or something, I'll, I'll do it. And, but yeah, the, like things like uh, I think global constraints in some cases um, tend to be ones that I, I find it harder for myself to pick up. Right. Um, things like global entropy and like like I said, anti night um, are exceptions to that. But some things like yeah, non consecutive, um, anti king, like those types of things are just ones that I'm not as stoked about. Mm -hmm. Are there any setters that you you solve all their work, or you you look out for their their new puzzles? There's a handful of uh, setters out there that um, I try to solve as many as I can. I, I don't. I'm not one to like completely solve like all of the puzzles in any person's catalog. Mm -hmm. um, number one, I don't have the free time to do that. Uh, but number two, like there's a lot of setters that like whose puzzles I really enjoy and it's just kind of impossible for me to actually make it through all of them. So, you know, I try to, I try to spread it out and, you know, do, a, do some testing of puzzles too. Um, so, but there's like a handful of people out there. Like I mentioned a couple of names before, like Math Festo, I tried to do a bunch of their puzzles <clears throat> just because, of, you know, their, their style I think is close to mine. Um, People like Nixo uh, and that who I see s set a lot of puzzles. 
Right. Um, I, those are, that's kind of what I was talking about before about getting these like deeper understandings of the constraints. And mm -hmm. he's one of the setters I feel like is really, I mentioned that in the intro video for him. Uh, I feel like he's right. kind of mastered that. So it kind of depends on what I'm, I'm trying to learn too. If I know the setters are good at something I, and I'm trying to get better at that, I'll try to solve a bunch of their puzzles to see what I can learn. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, have you done any collaborative setting? And what, what value yeah. do, you, do you find in that? I've done a little bit. Yeah, um, Bell Seats and I have a couple of the Psycho Look and Say puzzles we've published together. Um, been doing a little bit of work with micro study on a puzzle recently. Um, and then Glum, Glum Hippo and I, we haven't set a puzzle together before, uh -huh. but um, there's a puzzle, what's um, what's in the Naname on my list? That was, um, I don't know if you remember, maybe it was back in October or so, there was a, uh, one of the CTC monthly setting prompts was like to do a duel. <laughs> and before that, we um, there was a pencil puzzle genre that he had found called Nanamaguri. Um, which is like a uh, a loop puzzle where um, it, 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 the loop kind of reflects off of right um, of angles, and you have to kind of make a loop that way. And so we were trying to figure out an interesting way to make that into a Sudoku variant, and we had some discussions like here's some interesting deductions that you know can be made from this. And then the prompt came up, and we said, why don't we just actually make each make a puzzle for this? And so I came up with this kind of cursed <laughs> looking grid with um uban style clues for the nanamaguri um mm. uh the angles that go into that and then uh killer sudoku for the rest of the puzzle so uh I, but i think like that collaborative sort of setting i i think is really helpful to try to see like i'm always interested to know what other people set like because i mentioned before it was always sort of like a mystery to me how people approach it Am I doing things that like I could be more efficient with, or maybe you know, is there another way to approach things? Um, but yeah, always happy to collaborate. Um, always open to ideas for that too. Right. Did you find that any of those collaborators had a very different approach to puzzling than you? Not really. Um, I, I mean, everyone has their own style, yeah. but. Um, it's kind of been limited, but uh, typically it's just been like more of a, like, hey, what do you think about this deduction? Or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it seems to be a, a little bit of a similar style as mine. That's probably what made it successful too, is, you know, if you got someone who's like much different setting style, it might be a yeah. little bit harder to collaborate that way. True. Uh, da, da, da. How do you balance creating puzzles that are challenging but not frustrating? Mm. That's yeah. That's that's what that's one of the things I'm working on too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you try to make things like as fair as possible. I mentioned a little bit before, like you don't want to put stuff in there that's like like some weird fin swordfish that you right. need to find in the middle of a puzzle. Like you know, you want to try to make it about the constraints you're using and try mm -hmm. to get an idea for where you think the setter might be looking or, or try to limit the the options where the setter can even think to look or the solver can even think to look mm -hmm. um, when they're doing the puzzle. So I try not to put like brutal steps into, into those types of puzzles. Um, sometimes though I have the mindset, it's like I want to make this thing really hard and see mm -hmm. if people can figure out this deduction. Um, a lot of those don't end up making it anywhere because they are people don't really tend to enjoy that type of deduction. <laughs> uh, but I think Secret Satan is a, a good outlet for that sort of thing. Right. All right, let's do some rapid fire questions while we still have time here. Uh, sure. So answer one or the other as fast as you can. Uh, high lowity or odd evenity? Odd evenity. Local or global deductions? Global. Coloring on good lifting? Coloring. Simple or complex? Complex. Favorite digit to dance to? Three. Not in the corner. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, geometry or arithmetic? Geometry. Uh, 
Penpa, F puzzles, Sudoku Maker, other. Penpa. Sudoku or pencil puzzles? Pencil puzzles. Chaos or order? Chaos. Big or little? Big. Digital or analog? Digital. Cages or lines? Cages. A dumb idiot or doomed yet? <laughs> <laughs> we'll say dumb idiot for the origin story. OK. Uh, arrows <laughs> or dots? <laughs> dots. Uh, <laughs> indexers or chess constraints? Indexers. To disambiguate a uh, given or an extra rule? Given. An uh, outside or inside clues? Outside. Uh, cheese or bread? Bread. Good or evil? Good. Lawful or chaotic? Chaotic. Okay, that's that's the rapid fire questions. Uh, we're we're gonna go maybe. Is it okay with you if we go like five minutes over because the stream like went down for a little bit? Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. Uh, Chameleon asked a question in chat. What motivates you to host speed setting contests? Yeah, so I just started doing that this year. Um, it was kind of, I don't really make New Year's resolutions, but it was kind of that where hmm. um, just, try, just trying to like, like push myself to interact with more people in like the Discord servers. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I did that more one on one with like um, making birthday puzzles for people or just mm -hmm. like interacting with people that way. But um, just trying to kind of, you know, talk to more people in like, this type of a setting. Plus, I, I, I always enjoyed speed setting contests. Um, and within the Skunk Works, um, there was a couple that were hosted, but it wasn't really done frequently. But everybody always seemed to have fun with them. So I decided, you know, be the agent of change that you want to see. So I decided right. to start setting them mm -hmm. uh, or starting them. And they're set up more um, because of time zone issues and all that, where instead of being more like, hey, we're all going to meet at this time and everyone's going to have 90 minutes and at the end, you're going to send all the puzzles to me. We try to do it more self-paced where it's sort of honor system based, but you know, you get this, this many days to pick a 90 minute window to set a puzzle hmm. and try to make some something fun out of that. Uh, the first one we did um, was in January. I had said, you know, we're going to do a speed setting contest and you know, the prize is going to be, I'm going to make you a, a puzzle as a gift hmm. uh, for winning the contest. And so send me your most and least favorite constraints so that I know what kind of puzzle to set. Well, the participants didn't know that the prompt was going to be, you have to set a puzzle with one of your most favorite constraints and one of your least favorite constraints. <laughs> kind of funny. on the theme of like New Year's resolutions, like right. you know, overcoming adversity. Uh, and I, people, you know, enjoyed that. I think they had a, a really good time uh, with the event and that a lot of positive comments about the prompt. So decided to do another, uh, March madness themed one, uh, Zeon risk had reached out to me with the idea. So we got like a bracket style tournament where we're going to do speeds, uh, a speed solving our speed setting bracket. Mm -hmm. That's going to be judged. Cool. So got 32 people involved. So there's going to be a lot of puzzles to test. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. That's crazy. But it should be fun. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, Zombie Hunter asked this question a couple times in chat. How many puzzles have you set that you could not solve later because it was too hard? <laughs> There's a couple that I struggled with a lot uh, of my earlier setting. Yeah. Actually, the first puzzle, that rotational symmetry one, I, I never uh, I wrote a solve guide for it mm -hmm. at some point and sent it to CTC, but I had like lost the solve guide somehow. So <laughs> at some point I went back and I was like, what was this set that I used? And it took me a few hours to find the break in again. <laughs> but I don't not uh, a good sign. <laughs> no, exactly. I was like, I wonder why they didn't feature this. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, since then I have actually tried to make it a habit to write solve guides for a lot of my puzzles. And so um, I'm never actually going to forget like what the logic is. But if I were to go back and pick up some of my old harder puzzles, it'd probably take me a while if I would just go in cold and try to remember what the logic was in them. 
Mm-hmm. But yeah. earlier right. in my setting, like I didn't solve a lot of like or didn't set or solve a lot of five star puzzles. So mm-hmm. yeah. um more of the recent ones I'm more likely to remember, I think. I I haven't stumped myself yet though. A lot of the harder puzzles that I've made, I haven't written solve guides for because I, I just I'm never gonna send them to anyone like CTC or anything because oh, yeah. like I don't think that's like oh like oh I have a feature that's like three hours long I don't want that you know <laughs> um, yeah uh, <laughs> so I just never wrote a solve guide to them and then sometimes I'm like yeah I don't I don't actually remember how to solve this <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And I don't necessarily do that to, because I'm going to submit it anywhere, right, but right. I do it more to make sure like I can concisely explain what's going on than other true, people should yeah, be able to find true. it. Yeah, if it's a hard puzzle, that, that is a good exercise for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that brings us to five minutes over. So we are, I think, I think we'll call it there. Uh, is that fair, guys? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us, and thank you, Doomed Yet, and thank you to all of these wonderful people, Doomed Yet included. Uh, yeah, thanks for the interview. It was great, and thanks, everyone, for voting to see me on here. Is it's it humbling? Is it right that you're one of my first Patreons? I think that's right. I probably I think I was your first one because I remember being in alone in an empty room in the Patreon right. channel for a little bit. Right. It didn't take long to get more though. Well, thank yeah. you especially, Doom Diad. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. More if if you have the means, support me Mercer. He's doing great work here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh I, I had a great time. I I think everyone else had a great time. And thank you so much for coming on here and uh joining us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks all. Have a good day. Yeah, have a, have a good rest of your day. And unfortunately, Doom Diet won't be able to announce the next interviewee because it was so close together that we had to schedule them at the same time. So FGM is the next interviewee and it's already scheduled. Sorry, Doom Diet. Yeah, but, uh, that's fine. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me as well. All right, see you guys in three days for that interview. Bye, everyone. <laughs>